I'm a 911 call taker, and in my profession, I can definitely say that we hear all sorts of crazy things. And I know what you're thinking. Have you gotten that my cat is stuck in a tree call? Yes. Yes, I have. Now, I want to clarify some things before I continue. I will be changing the names of the people involved to protect their identity, the location of where the events took place, and I will not mention the agency I work for. In my agency, being a 911 call taker and a dispatcher are two completely different positions. My job is to take the calls as they come in, jot down the necessary information, and then send it over to the police and fire dispatchers so they can send the information to the units out in the field. We work 12-hour shifts, and we get anywhere from 200 to 300 plus calls on a single shift. When I started, I was told that there are three calls you never forget. Your first call, your last call, and the call that will haunt you forever. The day started just like any other. I was working the night shift so I would be at work from 6 in the evening to 6 the following morning. I had my dinner, coffee, and Mountain Dew ready to go. I got situated at my station, logged into the system, and began to take calls. Just a regular night. I had a motor vehicle crash where one driver was trapped inside his vehicle. I had a domestic situation where a kid called in saying that his dad was beating up his mom. And a parking complaint. Nothing major. My buddy Frank was in the station next to me and said, Quiet night, isn't it, Kevin? I turned to him and said, There you go, Frank. Opening that big mouth of yours, you said the Q word, and now the night is going to go to shit. <sighs> For those of you who don't know, the word quiet or any other synonym is frowned upon being said while on shift. He chuckled and went back to his phone. Surprisingly, the night did stay pretty quiet. Around midnight is when calls start to die down, so I went up and heated my dinner. When I came back, I saw that there was a 911 call waiting to be answered. I asked if anybody was going to take the call, but no one else had it popping up on their screen. I just brushed it off and took the call. 911, where's your emergency? I asked into the phone line. I got nothing but silence. I spoke again. 911, where is your emergency? Still silence. I took the phone number and ran it through our system to pinpoint the possible location of the call. Because the call came in as a cell phone, I located the cell phone tower it came off of and was able to find where the call was coming from after that. I managed to find that the call was coming from my neighborhood. Nothing struck me as alarming at that point because I get calls like this all the time. 911, where's your emergency? I asked a little louder. Then the phone went dead. Per our general orders, we have to call back. So that is what I did. I called back. But I was met with a voicemail saying the person could not be reached at this time. Again, I wasn't shocked. I get calls where there's an open line and nothing happens more often than not. I hung up, filed the call away. And when I clicked the button to be ready for the next call, the phone immediately rang. 911, where's your emergency? Again, silence. I looked at the number and it was the same number that had just called me. Listen, if this is a bunch of kids prank calling, know that you are dialing 911 and I will send the police out if this continues to be an issue. Do you understand? I waited for a response, but none came. Hello? Is anyone there? This is a sir. And then, a blood-curdling scream came across the line. I jumped out of my seat and my headset flew off. I quickly gathered my composure and got back on the line. Hello? Hello, are you there? I tried to get an answer, but all that was there was screaming. It sounded like a woman, and something was being torn. I could actually hear tearing in the background. It was hard to make out due to the woman screaming, but I could still hear it. Ma'am, can you hear me? Where are you at? The phone went dead again. I quickly sent a call through to the dispatchers with the information I had. Location, 46728 Benedict Lane. Incident, assault with injuries. Comments, call taker can hear a female screaming and something being torn. 
Cannot get any further information from the caller. Caller has hung up. Will attempt to make contact again. I sent the call to the dispatcher and immediately the call was sent out due to the severity of my comments. I called the number again but was met with the same voicemail. I tried again, two more times, but I got the same result. I updated the call saying that I couldn't make further contact. I watched on my mapping screen as the units were on the way to the house. I looked down and saw a call pending in my queue. I answered the phone, but before I could say anything I was met with the same female screaming again. I shouted to try and get her attention. Hello? Ma'am? Can you hear me? Help me! Help me! Somebody help me! I heard her scream into the phone. Ma'am, I have help on the way. Tell me what's going on. He's here. He's here. He's here. He's here. Ma'am, who is there? I'm going to die. I'm going to die. I'm going to die. I'm going to die. Ma'am, you're not going to die. I'm going to be on the phone with you until help arrives. They're almost there. I continued to try and get more information about her, but I wasn't getting anywhere. Then, in the background, I heard a male's voice. Abigail. Oh, Abigail. Why are you hiding from me? We've played lots of games tonight, but hide-and-seek is not one I wanted to play. Ma'am, your name is Abigail? Y yes. Okay, Abigail. Listen to me. Help is almost there. Tell me... Who is this man? I... I don't know. He just appeared in my house and then... Then he... She couldn't finish her sentence before she began to break down crying. The only thing that snapped her out of it was the man. In the background, I could hear a door creak followed by light footsteps and then he spoke. Abigail, if you promise to come out right now... I promise that the last game we play will be fun. It's called Tag. You remember how to play, right? Abigail didn't give a response. Abigail, I know you're in the fucking closet. You don't want to play? Fine. I'll just come in there and join you. I could hear the footsteps get louder and louder as he approached the closet door. It sounded like he was at the door when I heard through the phone... This is the police. The house is surrounded. You have lost. Come out with your hands up and we'll do this the easy way. I guess it really is time to play hide and seek. I heard him say as he ran out the room. Abigail, I'm still here. The police are downstairs. You're safe now. No, I'm not. I'll never be safe. And with that, she hung up the phone. <laughs> One of the most frustrating things about being a call taker is that you never really get to find out what happens to the calls you send through. I mean, sometimes you'll be able to guess, but 99% of the time, you'll be left in the dark. What I do know about this call is that the guy was never found. The police never saw anyone come out of the house at all, and when they searched the entire residence, they didn't find anyone either. They questioned Abigail about who the man was, but all she could say was, I'm not safe. I will never be safe. No evidence of forced entry or DNA that didn't belong to Abigail was ever found. To this day, no one knows who the man was. Months passed and no further information was ever found until, finally, the case went cold. That call has haunted me since that night. Why am I telling you all about this? It's to warn you and my fellow call takers that there is a dangerous person on the loose. How do I know this? Because he called me. Earlier during my shift, I got a call, and when I answered the phone, the voice I heard on the other side sent a chill down my spine. Hello, Kevin. Are we still playing hide-and-seek? Because if we are, it's your turn to hide. I'm really at the end of my rope here. No, check that. I was at the end of my rope weeks ago. 
Now I'm sort of clinging to the side of the cliff by one bloody fingernail. I didn't even know that you could get banned from calling 911. 31 calls over 36 nights later, and I know the truth. They told me that unless they find an actual emergency situation, the next time they respond, they'll arrest me on the spot and haul me off to jail. And you know what? Honestly, that doesn't sound like a bad idea right now. Except for the part where I'd probably lose my children. Like I said, this started 36 nights ago. My ex-husband had the kids for the weekend and I was looking forward to just relaxing by myself with some red wine and something dumb on Netflix. I was in the kitchen pouring out my wine when I looked out the window and I thought I saw something there in my yard. A person. It was dark out so I rushed over to the light switch and flipped it up. The outside light turned on and flooded the yard. Nothing there. I shrugged it off and sat down on my couch, scrolling through my Netflix options. Then the front door started rattling. That got my attention. After a while the rattling stopped, but I sat there frozen for several minutes. Then the doorbell rang. The sound like a dagger into the silence. I spilled some wine. It's probably Alan. Probably just forgot something for the kids and forgot that I changed the lock. I sighed and got up to check the door through the peephole. Somebody was there alright, but it wasn't Alan. At least I didn't think so. It was a man, dressed all in black, including a black ski mask. As I was watching him, he reached down and grabbed the doorknob and started rattling the door again. That was when I made my first 911 call. I have seen that man every night since. The only reason I've made 31 911 calls instead of 36 is that for four of those nights, the cops were parked right outside of where I was staying. When I saw him, I only needed to flick the lights four times and that would signal the cops. And while I saw that man for 36 nights in a row, the cops saw him zero times. Not after I installed a camera pointing at my backyard. Not after I installed cameras all around the house. Not after I installed the cameras inside the house. They never saw him, but I did. Every night, sometimes hiding in the shadows, sometimes standing inches away from me, breathing heavily. I will tell you about one night, so you can understand how terrified I am. This was definitely the worst night in isolation, but the longer this goes on, the more every night becomes worse than the last. This was a bit over a week ago, maybe 10 days. I started off feeling some guarded relief. The cameras were all installed around the house, and the cops were parked outside. If and when this creep showed up, they'd get him. Or if not, then at least the cameras would prove that he existed, and maybe offer up some clues to his identity. I put the kids to bed and let myself have a bit of wine, to help relieve that lingering terror. By the time I was ready for bed, I felt fairly relaxed and confident that I was safe for the first time since this thing started. I was ready for a good night's sleep, and I passed out pretty much as soon as I settled into bed. Sometime in the night, I was awakened by the creak of the floorboards by the foot of my bed. For half a second, I was confused with the half-hangover haze. Then I understood. Somebody was in the room with me. I had a gun in the room, but I kept it in a lockbox at the top of my closet where the kids couldn't reach it. It was useless to me just then. How the hell did he get past the cops, I wondered, as another foot landed on the floor with a soft thud. Mommy? My heart almost exploded with relief. It was my four-year-old kid, Alex. Come on, I said, sitting up and patting the bed. On most nights, he still ended up in there with me. Mommy? There's a man in my room and he wants to see you. I bolted out of my bed. Stay here, I said, running to the closet for the gun. He's nice, said Alex. He gave us candy. Oh God, Shane is still in there. My hand gripped the gun in the box, wavering. Did I want to bring a loaded gun into a room with my six-year-old kid? I didn't know the answer, but I pulled the gun out anyway and ran down the hall after closing Alex in my room. When I got there... There was a man sitting on the bed with Shane. Shane was eating a candy bar, smiling. Mom, he said. Mr. Knight is awesome. How come you never told us about him? The man was holding a knife up behind Shane's back. I kept the gun behind my own back. What do you want? I asked. Then, 
I heard the man speak for the first time. He kept changing his voice, modulating it in agitated ways so that it was really high-pitched and then really low, now fast and smooth, now slow and stuttering. I want what any man wants, he said. I want your devotion and your gun. Hand it over or you know the boy goes night, night for a long, long time. The hand holding the gun was slick with sweat and my stomach was in knots as my heart pounded away in primal terror. You have a gun, Mom? asked Shane. And if I do give it to you, then what? I asked the man. Then I'll leave for now. No sense causing a ruckus with those officers down there if I don't have to. He lifted the knife an inch higher. And no sense you causing a ruckus either, is there? I handed him the gun. Good call, he said. He lowered the knife, then turned to Shane. Hey, bud, Mr. Knight has to get going now. Lots of other kids to give candy to. You be a good boy and we'll meet again soon. Yeah? I'll be good, said Shane. The man stood up and walked to the open window. I know that I locked that. He stepped out on the garage roof as I grabbed Shane and yanked him back into my room. I flicked my lights on and off four times. By the time the cops got inside and upstairs, the man was gone. That was the last night I spent with my kids. I see them during the day, but never at night. The man does not seem interested in them, only in me. I can't, for the life of me, think of who this man might be. Somebody I know? I'll admit, I did turn my thoughts towards Alan, my ex-husband. We had had some nasty fights before and after the divorce. But would he really hold a knife above his own child's back? I didn't think so, but I tested it one night. The kids stayed with my mother, and Alan stayed with me in the kids' room. I knew it wasn't him because at 1 a.m. I woke up to the man throwing acorns at my window. He was there in the driveway, somehow always just out of the camera's view. Alan was snoring away in Shane's bed. I've racked my brain trying to think of who it could be. It just doesn't make sense. None of it does. It's just a nightmare without reason. How is he there every night and always gone without a trace by the time the cops get there? How is it possible? It doesn't matter where I am. At my house, at my mother's house, at this hotel. He always finds me. He always lets me see him. And he always disappears back into the night. Sometimes... I wonder if I really am imagining it. Shane and Alex both say they remember Mr. Knight. But maybe I put that thought in their head. That's what the cops think. That's why they've issued a written warning to me about calling 911 again. And it's what Alan thinks. He's started to talk about taking full custody. At least until I get better. Sometimes the man leaves me notes but they are always printed out and the cops think that I'm the one who prints them out. They even found a Word doc on my computer with one of the notes. And now, now I'm holding the latest note, which he slipped under my hotel door as I was writing this. It says, tonight's the night. I don't know what to do. If I call the cops and he's not here, I get arrested and probably lose custody of my kids. And if I don't call the cops and he is going to do something tonight, he's here. (laughs) 